This is Jeremy Bassetti, and you're listening to Travel Writing World, a podcast featuring interviews with travel writers about their work and about the business and craft of travel writing. You can find the episode show notes, free travel writing resources, and much more at travelwritingworld.com. Where can travel writing go in the 21st century? Author and lifelong travel writing aficionado Tim Hannigan sets out in search of this most venerable of genres, hunting down its legendary practitioners and confronting its greatest controversies. Is it ever okay for travel writers to make things up? And just where does the frontier between fact and fiction lie? What actually is travel writing? And is it just a genre dominated by posh white men? And what about travel writing's queasy colonial connections? Tim Hannigan joins me today to talk about these issues, which he writes about in his new book, The Travel Writing Tribe. He also gives a discount code to purchase the book at 25% off at the end of the episode, so be sure to stick around for that. Before we begin, though, I'd like to give a shout out to Ryan Gibbs for supporting the show. If you'd like to support the show with only a few dollars, pounds, or euros a month, please visit travelwritingworld.com support. Also, another shout out to Eric De La Gente, who left a wonderful five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy Travel Writing World, please leave a review on whichever podcast app you use. And now, here is Tim Hannigan. Tim, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much, Jeremy. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. I invited you on to talk about your new book, The Travel Writing Tribe. So I want to begin by talking about a story uh, that occurs at the beginning of it. Uh, it was an early spring day. You were on an, an assignment for a magazine to profile a writer. So you set off to Cornwall and you knocked on the writer's door. And the man cracked open the door, invited you in for a drink, and you two sat in a messy library um, as he took sips from his uh, glass uh, uh, flask and you talked about travel writing. So I was wondering if you could tell us about um, this experience that you open up the book with. Sure. Yeah. Um, the writer was was Philip Marsden, who's a, a writer I sort of admired greatly. He was kind of one of the, one of, one of the writers as a, as a younger person reading travel writing, really getting into travel writing. He was one of the kind of big names of, of the 1990s. There was this, this whole sort of uh, mass of British travel writers, kind of the second, the second generation of late 20th century British travel writers. The first ones were sort of Colin Thu, Bron Bruce Chatwin, Paul Theroux, although he's American. He was he was based in Britain when his travel writing career started, and Jonathan Rabin. Um, and then, then at the end of the 1980s, coming to the 90s, you got this, this second wave, which was Philip Marsden, William Dalrymple, Sarah Wheeler, and people like that. So Philip Marsden was was somebody I, I read for many years and, and sort of greatly admired. Um, so I was tasked to go and do this profile of him for a magazine, but I kind of... Uh, took it and ran with it uh, and asked him things that were never going to go in a, a glossy magazine article, um, things about travel writing practice, things about the ethics of travel writing. Um, you know, really took the opportunity to, to dig into it. And as you know yourself, travel writers generally like talking about travel writing. <laughs> and um, and Philip Marsden was very happy to very happy to let the conversation run. So it ran on and on. And then I was left to try and pluck out a kind of fluffy um, magazine article out of it, which I did eventually. But it just set this idea in, in place that, um, that this approach, going and talking to travel writers, might be a way to, to dig into concerns and worries and anxieties around travel writing that I'd had for, for a long time. Um, as somebody who was kind of a travel writer myself, um, somebody who dabbled in travel writing scholarship and somebody who was a lifelong committed reader of travel writing. It was a genre I was fascinated by and obsessed by, but also just a little bit concerned by. And I don't really think there is another mainstream popular genre that is potentially so problematic or, or, or at least, at least 
interesting in a slightly difficult way as, as travel writing. Um, there are questions around travel writing that you just don't get with, with novels or, or even memoir. Um, so yes, uh, I just came to this, came to this, this idea that talking to travel writers might be a good way to, to dig into those things and really confront them. Yeah. Great. I wanted to start out with a scene with, uh, Philip, because it introduces uh, some key concepts uh, that you return to later in the book, as you alluded to the ethics and the, the concerns. Um, and, and, and namely, um, you know, one of the issues that the, the book deals with uh, pretty heavily is this idea of truth in travel writing. Uh, but before we go there, um, before we start talking about some of these issues like truth, um, I want to circle back and ask you about uh, something you and Philip spoke about, and um, and that is the idea of the classic travel book in in terms of its formal qualities. So I'm wondering if we can like dive a little bit into the definition debate. So how how would you define travel writing? And I, I guess maybe why do academics have such a hard time defining the genre? It's it's a funny thing. Um, I mean, academics love. <laughs> love <laughs> um, wrangling and debating with definitions of various things. Uh, if you think travel writing is is a is a thorny one, you should try try digging into the academic definitions of creativity. That's a whole other mm. other plane. Um, it, it, so I think part part of the reason that um, there is all this wrangling and debate around how exactly to pin down travel writing is is just that's how academia works when it's confronting <laughs> uh, a thing um you know likes to split hairs and 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 not make any final definitive decisions but i think there there is more to it than that because if you if you ask sort of non-academic people or academics who aren't in literary studies or who are in literary studies but just don't know travel writing what's travel writing you'll you'll get a variety of answers um, and people who don't read narrative travel books or literary travel books if you say what's travel writing to them they'll they'll probably talk about lonely planet guidebooks and magazine articles they'll kind of assume that's what travel writing is um which is writing about travel but a very different thing to the kind of books that say philip marsden writes so i think that that kind of strange breadth is part of the problem and then sometimes you'll ask somebody and they'll and they'll say oh travel writing and they'll name novels about about journeys or novels about places that are distant or foreign to their primary <laughs> the readership. Al the so, alchemist. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a journey narrative. It's mm -hmm. a quest narrative. Sure. Um, so there's, there's there's certainly a, a travel element in there. So I think partly it's that kind of that that breadth. When when talking about all of that stuff, I quite like the idea of calling it writing of travel or literature of travel to take in all of that from from the alchemist to the lonely planet guide to southern spain or wherever it might be um i, I quite like that idea now that's clearly not uh not a genre that's a, that's a theme um or an arch genre or something like that if you want but i, I personally think that there there is definitely a genre of of travel writing and that's what my book is about the people I go to talk to are writers in that genre which is a narrative um primarily received as non-fiction and overwhelmingly first person mode um now that's that probably in itself isn't enough to make a genre that's a form um but I think what makes it a genre is its own awareness of its genre status because Travel writing, English language travel writing, certainly uh, of the last century or last half century, has talked to itself. Um, all of those travel writers I mentioned, people like Philip Marsden, all were aware that they were writing in a tradition. Um, so they would nod to other writers. In it. You know, Philip Marsden starting out very much was looking to emulate Colin Thubron. Colin Thubron was very much writing in the tradition of Patchouli for more, um, Dan Morris, people like that. So, um, so I, I think that that fact that, uh, that there's intertextuality, that, that there's an awareness of a tradition is what makes it more than a form and makes it, makes it into a genre. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you talk so, about, 
Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You, you, you talked about uh, intertext, intertextuality as also uh, being one of the, the features, I guess, of the form, but also one of the, the problems uh, when, when talking about things like Orientalism and othering and, and the tradition of colonial colonialism in, in, in literature. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I would say that travel writing has often come in for particular particular sharp criticism on on that front for its kind of relationship to colonial discourses, mm-hmm. to a to a colonial heritage, to problematic old power structures. Um, I, I don't think for a minute that travel writing is is uniquely involved with those things. Pretty much everything is. Um, you know, <laughs> right. television news reports right. and certainly novels, uh, the adverts that you see in the gaps between TV shows. I mean, they're, they're all connected to it because no, no text, whether it's a written one or a filmic one or whatever, no text exists in a vacuum. You know, it's all part of a discourse and, and things come out in them. I mean, some of the most horrendous, egregious, problematic Orientalism is in Hollywood movies, including pretty pretty recent ones, right? Mm-hmm. But it's because of what what travel writing is made out of, which is somebody travelling to generally a foreign place or a place that's in some way foreign, and kind of encountering that that difference um, and then writing about it. Uh, it does put it right at the kind of forefront, right at the the, the kind of sharp point of of that. So. Um, travel writing isn't uniquely problematic in that way, but it is, it's yeah, well in the, well in the, in the crosshairs. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's that, that thing of the ideas that we all carry when we, when we travel, mm-hmm. if we travel to an, uh, another place, another country, generally we will have some ideas about that place before we, we get there. And if we've done our research, done our preparation, we'll have more ideas. But where did those ideas come from? They came from things we read. That might be the guidebook. That might be previous kind of narrative travel books, um, TV shows, Hollywood movies. All of that stuff is kind of in our heads. And all of that means that the way we see a place is not pure. It's not clean. Um, and then the way we make sense of it is kind of influenced or infected by all of that <laughs> stuff. And then if we happen to be somebody who then writes about it, some of that stuff comes back out in the writing. Um, even if we think we're just reporting what we saw in Bali or in Bogota or wherever it might have been, some of what we we end up writing comes from elsewhere. It comes from other texts. Right. And so this is the big problem because if, if, there are, if there's a um, kind of tradition of of texts that debase the other, debase the foreign, or you know, are come about in the tradition of colonialism, and people are referring back to those texts. Then um, those those ideas undoubtedly somehow seep into the narratives that come out later. Of course, and and, and we can't we can't help ourselves. We're all we're all guilty of it. Um, I mean, I always use the word exotic as as a way to to illustrate this. I mean, what does exotic mean? It's originally from the Greek. It just means basically outside, as in not not here, not where we are. Um, So that's a a value-laden word because exotic to uh, an ancient Greek typically kind of meant what lay to the east in Persia and and beyond, or also to the northwest in these wild barbaric Celtic sort of lands. Um, so, so there's value judgment in that, but what's exotic to an ancient Greek was not the same as what was exotic to an ancient Persian or an ancient Celt, right? And the same applies now. So if you ask somebody from a kind of cold northern place, somewhere like the UK or <laughs> Ireland, what does exotic mean? They'll almost always think of palm trees and beaches and possibly temples and incense smoke and that kind of thing which is is stuff linked to Orientalism. If you ask somebody from Bali or Southern India, which is kind of what they were imagining, what does exotic mean to you? It's not going to mean that, is it? Um, It's going to mean something very different, possibly somewhere cold and rainy and grey and northern. (laughs) I'm glad you brought this uh, this idea of the East because somewhere in the book uh, you're having a conversation with William Dalrymple and he mentioned something about the quadrant, uh, where the the places where um, the the classical kind of travel, the classical tradition and travel writing, they like to go out east and to go to that 
to that part of the world, that quadrant, I think, uh, is, is the term he used. So I was wondering if you could talk about like the the, tra- the classical tradition of uh, or the classical tra- travel book when compared to some of the more modern or contemporary works. Yeah, I, I think the the specific quadrant Dalrymple refers to is is between Istanbul and Cairo and Calcutta. It's this sort of <laughs> section of the world, the the kind of um, the Middle East and, and across as far as the Indian subcontinent, which certainly has been very well trodden, particularly by British travel writers from really from um, from the 18th century right up to the 1990s. I mean, that's where uh, people like. Philip Marsden and William Dalrymple really kind of started their careers and carried on in the case of Dalrymple as working into that that region. Um, and, and that, I think, indicates that that genre and that tradition. This is where before they had been there, um, Colin Thubron had been there and before Colin Thubron had been there, um, the likes of um, Robert Byron had been there and Freya Stark had been there. Wilfred Thesiger had been there going back into um, sort of uh, um, Burton and people like that back into the 19th century. So there was very much this strongly established tradition that generally pretty, pretty elevated class and educational background young Britons go out into that region having read the books of their predecessors and and then kind of write about it um that doesn't mean that what they write might not be brilliant some of my favorite books in the world are uh, in that tradition but when you just think about it yeah there's this kind of endless procession of of um <laughs> generally generally english although Dalrymple would would uh, would take umbrage at that he's very much scottish um uh, but british we'll say british people largely from a particular educational and, and social background going out into that space um it's not necessarily a bad thing but you do have to recognize right. the the structures that are built into that Right. And so this is part of the the classical tradition of the travel book. Um, you refer to in the book that the classical travel book or the classical tradition, you know, is in some ways, um, a, a, as you mentioned, kind of intertextual, referring back to the earlier tradition of, of travel writing, but it's also steeped in kind of this um, scholarship or the sense of scholarship. So, you know, you have these uh, kind of explorers in some cases, in some cases, uh, book nerds, but they're they're learning the language, they're learning the history, and they're wrestling with um, some broader or some larger theme than just the journey itself, right? Yeah, and that's what makes it such a seductive thing. Um, and the and genre, that's why, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's and that's why I, I am always keen to to defend travel writing when people say, well, look, you know, this is this is this is a problematic thing. Say, well, sure, there are problematic things in that in an old Etonian going out and wandering through Afghanistan and writing about it. <laughs> but but the impetus behind that is surely a positive thing. I mean, going out to find out about places to to you know, undertake a sincere scholarly endeavor about the history of the architecture or the cultures of that place, and then writing about it in not a dry academic style, a, a sort of um, literary style and a, a finely written narrative that you can read for pleasure just as much as you can read a novel. Um, that's that's a, a pretty a pretty honorable intent, even if there are problematic shards of colonial discourse in it. So I am, even though I'm always very quick and keen to point out the problems with the travel writing tradition, I would, I would at the same time also say, hang on a minute, that, you know, this is, this is not, this is not a, um, a, a bad, a bad thing at heart to want to do, to, to go out and find stuff out and encounter difference encounter different cultures and then write about it right is but that, there is an, an awareness is needed of the the problems that are attached yeah that fascination that you just charted with with uh travel writing does that come from the perspective of being a practitioner or or a reader because I, there's a tension in your book between the practitioner the reader and the academic right? it seems like they're all driving <laughs> down parallel i think this is a metaphor you use in the book parallel one-way streets right Sure. Um, yeah, look, it, it's kind of the, that was in a way, although I didn't realize it at the beginning, that was what the quest object of the book turned out to be trying to work out which one I am. Um, <laughs> of course you can be more, more than one thing. I mean, that's, that's kind of key. Hybridity is key to, to the most contemporary travel writing. It's a real key feature of it. And um, so that's, that's fine. But ultimately, 
um i would my affiliation would lie with the readers i'm i'm a reader um first and foremost i mean i think anyone who's an academic needs to be needs to be a reader and of course academics are readers but i think i think it's potentially easy to to lose the kind of joyous reading mm-hmm. um that probably started you in the first place and nobody who's a travel writing practitioner really um is is such a thing without having been a reader first and foremost. I mean, there are certainly travel writers who who say or claim that they became travel writers without being steeped in the travel writing genre, but they would have certainly been readers of other things. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, re- I'm reader first and foremost, and it's as a reader that I I just love, you know, that that picking up a book by by somebody who is going to share with me a big load of knowledge. Um, that they have worked on, that they have gathered, and also a, a finely written account of the journey they undertook to sort of further explore that knowledge or to put that knowledge in context. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's as a reader, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the, the the quest object is trying to sort that out, but um, there's another quest object of the, of, of the book, and um, as the narrative presents us, that you're, you're going out to seek and interview living British travel writers, right? And so I was wondering if you could just give us a nuts and bolts sense of who it is you spoke with, um, how did you determine to speak with them, and maybe some of the the, the issues that, uh, well, as a reader and as, as, as a writer, you, you mention yourself in the book, and that is uh, the, the gender debate. So nuts and bolts, who, who, yeah. who you talk to, why did you talk to them, and Let's talk about sex. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I, it was kind of an academic undertaking, but it was also a personal one, and and it was meant to be a, a kind of journey through my own reading history. Um, so when I was thinking about who do I want to speak to, once having spoken to Philip Marsden, this idea had really come together into a, a real project. Um, so I kind of thought who who are the big writers who are the writers who who fascinated me and and were were core to my early obsession with travel writing that became a lifelong thing so they were those big names of the 1980s and and 1990s so those names kind of went straight on the list that's people like colin thubron um uh, and then going on to slightly older slightly younger generation uh, rory mclean sarah wheeler william dalrymple so there were people like that there were also three dead writers who i obviously wasn't going to get to actually interview in person but i wanted to engage with in some way and i did that through kind of archive work so that was wilfred thesiger patrick lee for more and bruce chapman so they were the kind of the the existing and current and recent canon if you like when i really first engaged with travel writing and as you'll notice there's only one woman in the list i gave you there's also dervla murphy who i did speak to too um so so it was a very male male body of writers but they they all kind of immediately suggested themselves in the initial brainstorm so they were all people kind of on my on my hit list um and I, I kind of arranged it chronologically in a way that I started with those writers and then moved forward into writers I'd read more recently who had kind of excited me more recently and who felt like they were they were kind of doing something different and taking things in a different direction. So those people were, were kind of my first list. And then moving on, I kind of came towards people like Manisha Rajesh, um, Kapka Kasabova, Samant Subramanian. Um, and then there were, there were sort of a couple of, of um, younger British writers who maybe were in the in the older tradition when you first kind of looked at what they were doing, but actually turned out maybe not to be quite so much. People like Nicholas Jubber, who at first glance, you look at the books and they seem to be in that, that classical tradition, but there's a very different... Um, sensibility underpinning them as well so it was uh yeah it was starting with the the canon that would have existed in the 1990s and then moving forward into where things are now Mm -hmm. and what do you you just mentioned a a different sensibility for the newer generation what do you think that might be might it have something to do with truth or 
Actually, no, I wasn't really thinking about that. Um, it's more about a sense of almost anxiety. So out of the kind of younger travel writers I spoke to, they're basically two, two white British guys, um, uh, one of who's Nicholas Jubber and the other one is Patrick Barkham. And they're both great writers who write really, really good books. Um, but there's a certain, in both of them, there'd be a certain sense of trepidation in very different ways and how it manifests uh, and, and sort of uncertainty, which I think is absolutely warranted. I mean, those guys, if they had been born 20 years earlier, would have been marching off with that sort of sense of absolute security. That, right. yeah, of course, off I go to wherever it is, Turkmenistan to write a, uh, a, a, a book. Um, so there was, yeah, it was more, it was more that there was a kind of uncertainty and trepidation around them really. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I was, I'm just remembering um, Nicholas Jubber, his most recent book, it's the one about the ep- epic continent. And, you know, there are times where throughout this book, he's, you know, huddling in, in a plaza going to sleep and there's this uncertainty about his medication and where he's going to, where he's going to get some food the next day, you know, and it, it certainly is, is quite different from, as, as you note, like the strong kind of assertive explorer who, who goes marching about, or at least, you know, he's, what's interesting is that we're actually reading about the insecurities, whereas someone like Thesiger, though he may have had some, he certainly is not going to drop the persona and show those insecurities to us. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I meant, particularly in Nicholas Jubber's case, because his books do kind of adhere to that tradition they're very scholarly you know he mm-hmm. takes a takes a subject uh, and really digs into it learns learns languages and does does the project in the same way people like Patrick Lee from Oricon Zubron would have been doing but without that without that sort of great sense of assurance and I think that's a positive thing I think that makes them more interesting more interesting books as books written in the 21st century certainly mm-hmm. So what about the sex uh, issue or the gender issue? Uh, uh, yeah, better, I wasn't trying to avoid that, Jeremy. I, <laughs> honestly, I wasn't. Um, yeah, it was it was a funny thing. It, it became a, a kind of raging, <laughs> raging anxiety because in the first section, that that kind of canon that I was picking names from was overwhelmingly male. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it just it just was. Um and you know, I kind of felt, well, what should I do here? Should I go around like looking for looking for women and to add just because I need to sort of balance it? But but then that also raised an anxiety in itself because the sort of two big names, um, two generations apart, but both kind of canonical by the late nineties, Sarah Wheeler and Dervla Murphy were there. I went and spoke to them, and they were sort of amongst the most interesting people I spoke to. Um, but but beyond that, it, I, I wanted I wanted people to be on the list um, f- because there were there were sort of solid reasons other than I just needed an extra woman, right? Right. Um, so the the only way I could deal with that, and this is where I think travel writing has potential, is self reflexivity by just discussing that openly in the book that geez, I've not spoken to enough women here um, and, and explaining that openly and, and saying so. But it kind of then resolved itself because as I moved to the end, the, the sort of final two living writers that I spoke to were both women of the kind of younger, um, more interesting uh, travel writing generation in Britain. One was Manisha Rajesh and the other one was Kapka Kasabova. And that just kind of happened naturally. It wasn't, it wasn't deliberate or cynical that the the last two living writers were were women they were just the women who who kind of fell into place and were natural and were the right people to end up with at the end which slightly assuaged that that great mass of um of of men (laughs) back down the line right and 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 these the last two that you spoke with kasabova and rajesh uh, are among the two best-selling authors that perhaps you've, you've spoken to in, in yeah. the book itself. So, and it has nothing to do with the fact that they're women, but it's just everything to do with the fact of the facts. Right. And there sure. was a point in the book where I think you were speaking with Dervla Murphy and you were talking about the, the, the so-called inner journey of, of travel narrative. And I suppose some scholars suggested that the inner journey was a, a gendered thing, a, 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 a female thing, which you poo pooed on right, rightfully. So, I mean, you know, you just think of Colin through bronze to a mountain to bed is all about the inner journey or 
half, at least half about the inner journey as, as it is the external one. So, you know, the female sensibility in travel writing isn't the, the inner, isn't necessarily the, the, you know, the so-called inner journey. Um, but their books have them, Jubber's books have them. So is there, is there a, a gendered travel writing? Is that a stupid academic concept? Is there something special to the writing of people like Kasabova and Rajesh that have to do with the fact that they're female? Um, th- okay. So behind that, there's, there's a, there's a wider point in terms of sort of the, the questioning whether there's something intrinsically linked to inner journeys in women's writing though. I mean, the person who would, who would poo poo that hardest would be Dervla Murphy herself. Right. I mean, she <laughs> yeah. sort of scoffs at the concept. <laughs> she's Absolutely. like, I didn't have one. <laughs> uh, yeah. But the, the interesting thing is she's very capable of that. Cause if you read her autobiography, wheels within wheels, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sort of devastating read. I'm um, still done with this kind of matter of fact, honesty, but very open about, about things. So it's not that she's sort of, intrinsic being capable of, of revealing the inner self or doesn't have one it's just that she doesn't she's she's cycling her bike to india she's not right. going to talk about what what emotional <laughs> problem she has that's her that's her kind of right. her perspective on it um but uh in terms of is there something something specific to women's travel writing particularly maybe the more recent ones. And I think Sarah Wheeler is, is a sort of exemplar of this. And then um, Kapka Gasparov and Manisha Rajesh come, come later. There, there fundamentally is something, and that's the fact that travel writing, unlike writing a novel, does demand you to get out there into the world, mm. um, does demand you to leave your room. You can write a novel without going anywhere without interacting with anyone but if you want to write a travel book that kind of is received as a travel book by readers you need to get your backpack and get on a train to Russia or wherever it might be you need to go and wander around villages in the Balkans you need to do those things you need to hitchhike through Chile and if you are a woman and especially if you happen to be a brown woman, then the way that the world interacts back with you in those places is going to be very different from the way it interacts with like me, a hulking six foot tall white guy, right? Are you six? So foot? I am, I'm six foot tall. Thank you. I think, I think, no, I think, yeah, that's, I'll take that as a positive. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm six foot tall. Uh, um, so there's a fundamental there's a fundamental difference yeah. there. Um, so the actual matter, the material that provides the travel writing with its raw source is always going to be different if you're a woman. So I I don't know if you can say there's a fundamentally different kind of inherent sensibility, but if you've been a woman traveling through a certain place, your experience is just going to be totally different. And this is a point. Man. And I think that's what's great about Manisha Rajesh's, um, particularly particularly her second book, actually, Around the World in 80 Trains, is there are, there are moments that just kind of give you a sharp nudge if you're reading complacently. You're like, whoa, yeah, God, it's very different to be a, a, brown, a young brown woman in Russia than it would be to be a six foot tall white guy in the same place. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, the situation is fundamentally different. Right. So there is a difference in that respect as to whether there's some kind of essential core difference in the sensibility. I don't think you can say one way or the other, because you've got Dervla Murphy on one side and then, and then Sarah Wheeler on the other side, right. both very kind of intrepid, tough travelers, but with a totally different approach to, to revealing the self or the inner right. journey. I was kind of leading you on the question because there's there's a part in the book um, where I think it, you were speaking with uh, Sarah Wheeler, and uh, she mentioned you know this very real difference in between men and, and women travelers, especially dealing with sensitive subjects. Right, if you're um, going into the house of someone and you're a man, you're perhaps seen as a threat, whereas a, a woman might might not have those same sorts of um, uh, roadblocks or, or, or problems when, when having conversations with people, right? Taran Khan's book, Shadow City, was so wonderful because because she was a woman, she was able to access, you know, domains inaccessible by men. And, and, and to have those two different uh, sides to the experience is what makes this genre so incredibly rich and rewarding. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's the flip side of that, that, that um, kind of raw material, 
Uh, the mm-hmm. potentially the sort of ostensibly negative bit is the rough experience on the Russian train. And then the positive side is, yeah, having access to those households in the Andes or in Afghanistan or wherever it might be. Um, so yeah, the, the, the raw experience, sure, is, is fundamentally different. Um, but the sensibility, ah, it varies from writer to writer. Your book covers several critical issues in travel writing today, and I, truth is is one that runs throughout the book. Um, it's one that you also play with in, in the book, um, especially at the end. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll leave the readers to to uncover that um, on their own. But um, in in travel literature, why is truth such a critical topic? I mean, we hear what? about we hear about Chatwin. <laughs> What's the issue here with truth? Okay, so there's there's something to say before we dig into that to qualify that. It's absolutely the biggest issue if you talk to just readers of travel writing. You know, if, if you talk to kind of people who like travel books, that's the topic that comes up. That's why we always go on about Bruce Chatwin. You know, he made a lot of it up, you know, he claimed <laughs> the song lines wasn't really a travel book. And, and, and so, tells the truth you know, that. this is a thing that occupies readers' imaginations that, that gets discussed in podcasts, in radio shows. Um, it, it, yeah, it's something that readers readers think about and travel writers think about because they know readers think about it. Academics, scholars of travel writing, weirdly uh, don't engage with it that much um, unless it's looking back to really old historical travel writing, you know, going back to kind of late medieval stuff even. Um, so there's this weird kind of thing that this is the big issue that preoccupies travel writers and their readers, but travel writing scholars are much more interested in gender and uh, and orientalism and that stuff, which is just a peculiarity. But there's absolutely no question that it is. You know, did is this what really happened? Did they make it up? Um, is a thing that that readers think about, and I think I think the reason for it is because despite us all being kind of knowing and all sort of recognizing that you know things are constructed we do still basically receive things as either fiction or non-fiction and that's not just books that's what we watch on on television as well now when you kind of stop and think critically it's pretty obvious that, that a lot of those non-fictional things that we receive are, are kind of not not absolutely 100% as it happened because you know, reality is messy and it's un, unbounded and it sprawls out in all directions. So when you've gathered material from the actuality and you want to present it as a narrative, whether that's a documentary film or or a book, you've got to kind of bring it down, corral it down and put it in a, in a straight line more or less, right? And we all sort of know that as readers or viewers, but we 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 don't kind of let it get in the way of our receiving things. I mean, you think about documentaries in particular, they're just full of flagrantly um, things that aren't actually real. The the classic one is the scene of the the interviewer going to the door and knocking on the door or meeting the guy in the park and saying, hello, you must be John. And it's very clear that they went there in the same taxi, right? Or it's very clear the film crew is already inside the house to get the other shot of John opening the door. Um, But we tolerate that. We, we We don't sort of... We don't, it doesn't interfere with our reception of this as a fundamentally true story. Um, and I think that applies to, to, to writing as well. So as soon as it gets kind of presented to us that, oh, did you know he, he, he didn't actually ride a horse? You know, he didn't have a horse or, um, you know, that guy wasn't actually there. He met him somewhere else. That, that, that troubles us because it messes with the way we receive it. So I think that's why this, this idea of, of truth or not telling the truth is, is such a, such a key issue because yeah, we don't, we don't like it It as readers. It breaks the inherent contract between the reader and, and writer, you know, the reader picks up the book, expects to read a nonfiction book, right? Can't be, it can't be fiction, but what about, what about fudging things? As you mentioned, you have to corral everything into a straight line. I mean, does it really matter that Thubron might not have thrown an owl out out of a train in China. <laughs> I mean, does that does that do details like that really matter um, from the perspective of a from the perspective of a reader, maybe, but from the perspective of a writer for the narrative? I mean, how important are those? Thoughts? Yeah, it's 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 a funny thing. Um, they definitely do matter for very many readers, not all readers, um, but a lot of readers 
Um, if you, if you, and, and it can be just minor inconsequential details. If you tell a reader, oh, you know, book X, uh, well, I, I, I wrote that I was, um, I was in a car and that bit and I went to town A and then to town B. Actually, I took a train to town B and then thought, well, I better go back to town A. But a lot of readers will respond really, really badly to that, even though that stuff was done for the sake of the narrative, the way you've reshaped it was to make a more logical and coherent narrative. Um, so it, 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 it does impact. And I think that's the fundamental underlying tension of travel writing. And I think this is one of the kind of key things that came out of the project and that is central to the book is really making clear just how much of attention that is for all travel writers negotiating that that tension between reporting what exactly happened and producing the smoothest narrative and while you mentioned it earlier i ran into that problem myself you know i had to rearrange things a little bit just for the sake of logic now the conclusion i kind of came to at the end is that the way to deal with this to be ethical about it is to reflect on it within the text and that's the great thing about travel writing that's kind of its ethical redemption is its capacity for meta narrative is the space that there is in a travel book in a way that there isn't in a novel, at least not a highly experimental novel, to talk about what you're doing as a writer, to, to reveal the mechanics. Um, uh, Nicholas Jubber said something lovely about, you know, a travel book is like being backstage. And I like right. the idea of lifting the panels off just here and there, you know, just saying, I'm just doing this uh, just to let you know I'm doing it because of, because of this. So that's what I end up doing in the book. I, I, I just tell people that, yeah, it more or less happened in the order that I told it happened, the, the, the individual encounters, but I have moved them slightly and this is how they actually happened. So now you can make your judgment. Yeah. That's, that's a great, great way to put it. I was thinking about it in terms of the um, performance convention, uh, breaking the wall, breaking the fourth wall. So um, for the listeners, if you haven't heard about this uh, convention, imagine a, a stage, right? And there, I guess there are more than three walls, but imagine that there's the back wall and the side walls and on the floor, there's a stage and there's an invisible wall between the audience, the spectators and the actors on the stage. Um in a traditional, I guess, performance, the actors pretend that the audience is not there, right? Um, but the the actors or the audience, uh, the actors or performers who break the wall, um, somehow acknowledge that they're in the play themselves or acknowledge the audience. And you're right, um, travel literature o- often peels back that the veil, or you know, we get a peek behind the curtain and see what's going on in the construction of the very thing that you're holding your, in your hands. And it's fascinating. No other jo- genre does that. No. Uh, and, it, and it's just got such a rich capacity for, for it. It's, it's there. So if anything, that would be my, one of my big arguments at the end to anyone else ri- writing travel writing, whatever kind of it, it is. Um, yeah. Make use of that, make use of that capacity to, to have a meta commentary on the text. And I mean, that sounds really highfalutin and, and, and maybe off-putting, but it doesn't need to be. Um, it can be just as simple as saying, oh, by the way, actually that happened on Tuesday rather than Wednesday. But so, you know, the reason I put it this way around is it just would have, you know, I wouldn't have made sense narratively. <laughs> um, and people like that. I mean, I mean, you think about kind of TV shows and, and, and um, films that bring that element in. That, that break the fourth wall. Um, people, people, people love it. There's a, there's right. a in the last couple of years, there's a sort of comedy drama show called Fleabag in the UK oh, that right. everyone just just adores. And the, the reason they adore it is she's forever breaking the fourth wall. I mean, it's not sort of a slapstick comedy; it's a sort of realist comedy. But she's she's always addressing the camera or nodding yeah. to the camera. So you can do that in travel writing too. Uh, and I think that's where there's this real rich potential in the United States. It's the parks and recreation, you know, the, 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 have you seen that show? No, I've heard of it. It's, though, it's yeah. wonderful, but you know, they're always aside. So the camera pans to the actor, the actor looks squarely into the lens and, you know, gives a wink <laughs> or, or has an aside conversation as, as if it were a documentary, they're all kind of actors in this documentary, which is, is very interesting. Um, we talked about truth. What are the, what other critical issues do you deal with in the book? So we, we sort of touched on um, gender already, which yeah. I absolutely, absolutely did. Um, the kind of underpinning one that runs all the way through it is um, the idea of representing 
otherness um the travely the travely yes to use the kind of gruesome academic term the travely <laughs> is the person who is traveled past by the the traveler and then typically represented in the text so that's that's a kind of that's the big the big issue drawn from the academic study of travel writing and that was kind of what I was thinking would be fundamentally key to it at the start. And it, and it is, and it runs all the way through, but gradually this truth thing just rose up and <laughs> kept smacking me around the back of the head and saying, Hey, Hey, um, talk to me. Um, because so, still yeah, related. That, I mean, that's a big thing. The, the, the representation representation of otherness of other places, of other people, other cultures. Okay. So out of all of the, the, the critical issues that you dealt with in this book, uh, what uh, one or two lessons did you learn that you're going to take away and, uh, and apply to your upcoming book about Cornwall? Um, thank you for mentioning <laughs> that one. Um, yeah. Uh, so the there was definitely kind of changes in my own perspective on travel writing. Um, I had for a long time, if you'd asked me uh, who are the writers you really, really kind of admire and that you would aspire to emulate i would would have certainly in the first few have listed colin thubron and philip marston and they it certainly in their their earlier work did have this sort of self-effacing mode where you know the the author figure although it's all written in the first person the author figure is really just the kind of outward focused eye Mm -hmm. you know channeling the knowledge that they've got from the library and reporting the experience that they've had on the ground and i kind of like that idea and um, was sort of wary of um, really uh, inner journey type books, say they were self-indulgent or solipsistic or so on. I didn't really want too much of that, I thought. But what I came to realise over the course of doing this journey, series of journey, series of encounters, and then writing it as a book, that actually that... um, element of of inner journey is actually an ethical mode in itself um what do you mean a, by that there's a, well there's a there's a wonderful wonderful book called the vulnerable observer by ruth bahar who's a who's a um american uh anthropologist but from a cuban jewish background so she's got a really interesting interesting sort of heritage herself um and she wrote this wonderful book uh essay collection called the vulnerable observer um, which she talks about the need to be a vulnerable observer in your encounters with the world if you're going to write them up. In her case, as an anthropologist, but that applies to travel writers, right. journalists, anyone, anyone encountering and writing about the real world. So to bring your own emotional baggage, your own heritage, your own um, your own emotive responses to things into it. One, it makes it more interesting, but two, it makes it more ethical because then the panels have come off again. Some of that backstage right. stuff is, is appearing. So I really definitely have strongly kind of come to the idea that that, that uh, self-reflective and reflexive mode is really, really important. Um, so that would be, that would be lesson number one. And then lesson number two is what we were talking about, um, just a moment ago, use the, use the capacity for the, for the meta narrative, use the capacity to talk about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And those two things I think are where, where travel writing's great ethical, redemption and ethical potential is and the amazing thing is when you stop and think they were there all along and they were being used all along i mean you look look at a writer like jonathan raven who's one of the big canonical figures of that 1970s 1980s generation a uh, kind of a posh white man um but if you read his books they're full of that they're full of real real reflection on on his positionality on on how he's being seen who he is in this circumstance and also on on what's feeding into the text itself so it's it's it wasn't sort of hidden away it was being used and you can go back way earlier than that and find little traces of it even in some of those kind of even colonial era travelers here and there um, so those are the two things, uh, yeah. The, the the sort of reflecting on yourself and using the using the meta narrative and a place to to go back to the inner, the insider outsider as as you mentioned in the book or the outsider insider going back to Cornwall your 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 home no. Yes. Oh, oh definitely. Um, and I mean, yeah, so I'm about to, about to, um, head off on a, on a journey, a long walk through Cornwall, which is where I'm, where I'm from. 
um, for a book which will be published by Head of Zeus in uh, well in a couple of years before it comes out. It's provisionally called the Granite Kingdom, a, a journey, a Cornish journey. It may very well be some something else by the time it's it's done. <laughs> um, but the the kind of theme of the book. It's going to look at some of the history as 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 you typically would. You want a kind of potted history in there, but the the theme, the first theme is how Cornwall has been represented um, in books, in film, in various media down the centuries, and how it's been exoticized. I mean, it's a place that has a lot of exotic projections put onto it within Britain. It's you know, one of these so-called Celtic Celtic fringe places. So it's gonna gonna look at that and, and address all of that, but it's also gonna try and dig into how that then impacts the Cornish sense of identity and a Cornish sense of like auto otherness, if you like, the idea. Because Cornish people, a lot of Cornish people tend to say, oh, we're Cornish, we're not English. And maybe all sort of <laughs> auto exoticize. Um, and then dig it as you dig further and deeper into that in my very personal circumstance, there's the fact that I do strongly identify as Cornish, but I wouldn't be ethnically Cornish I'd kind of be ethnically Irish I mean my my dad was from Scotland from an Irish family my mum my mum grew up entirely in Cornwall and her mum lived most of her life there but but there's no deep um deep uh roots beyond that there so you know and there are some people in Cornwall who would kind of give it an ethnic quality so that then leads me on to that question is you know am I can I call myself Cornish? Am I Cornish? Where do I really come from? Which as a, as a, as a white British guy is not something you customarily have to ask yourself or, or <laughs> get asked, but it's probably worth asking. It sounds like there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of uh, fertilizer there for, for kind of struggling or wrestling with a larger theme more than just a walk through the Grand oh, Kingdom. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It's not, it's not just going to be a war <laughs> by no means. Tim Hannigan, thank you so much for coming back and talking with us. Um, your, your new book, the travel writing tribe comes out, I think next month or in August in the United States, but in, uh, in the UK, it's out already. If you purchase it through the publisher, no, it is, it's, it's available now. If you, uh, go to the publisher's website, their publisher is Hearst. Um, and I have a discount code to share with mm. listeners of, uh, of Travel Writing World. So I will give that to you in a, in a minute. Um, uh, it's, yeah, so it's available now if you order it from Hearst. Um, and it will be available in all bookshops from the end of this month, from the end of May. And then in the US and worldwide and as an ebook, it should be out in August. It's very good. All, all lovers of travel writing ought to pick up this book. Uh, it's it's exciting. It is a travel narrative, but it deals with, uh, you know, the, the critical issues in travel writing. And it's not uh, dry academic, although it does deal with some of the critical issues. So everyone go out and get his book. What is the discount code? T-T-W-T, The Travel Writing Tribe. So T-T-W-T, capital letters, 25. Very good. We'll put that code in the show notes. And, uh, well, wish you success with this book. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Jeremy. It was a pleasure. You can find the episode show notes and much more at TravelWritingWorld.com. Please remember to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app. And if you find the show valuable, please consider leaving a review or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month at TravelWritingWorld.com slash support.